And welcome back, everybody, to a podcast in space and time. I'm Holden B. Huffman. And I'm Kendall Coffey. And today we are talking about Doctor Who Series 3, Episode 4, Daleks in Manhattan. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Swings a web in the sky, catch thieves, just like flies. Look out, here comes Spider-Man. So Spider-Man's in this episode. Spider-Man is in this episode. Yeah, like I can make a whole lot of Spider-Man jokes. Um, you know, I'm just really disappointed that he didn't whip out his webs and just save the day. Right. He just kind of yeah. stood around. Right, and this takes place in 1930s. Perfect time period for Spider-Man Noir. That's, maybe he hasn't that's been bitten. Yeah, maybe, yeah, he may not have been bitten yet. That's fair. You know, he's still in, like, the Spider-Man stage before, like, Uncle Ben gets shot on screen for the 10th time or (laughs) um, before the whole spider bite. Right. That's fair. Um, You mean Uncle Benjamin? Uncle Benjamin. That's right. Um, But soon we will see Spider-Noir come to... Well, I was going to say come to light, but that's not quite right. Come to <laughs> shadow. Ooh. Ooh. We will see him try to solve a Rubik's Cube. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, Andrew Garfield's in this episode. Andrew Garfield's in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> that was the joke. Yeah. But it ended up turning into a Spider-Verse joke. Yeah. Um, Nicholas Cage is not in this episode, unfortunately. Ooh, imagine Nicholas Cage being the 14th Doctor. Um... <laughs> I think I'll pass on that one. <laughs> well, I mean, with the whole timeless child thing. Well, never mind. I'll forget that. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so we got piggies. I'm going to have to reset my calendar to zero days since the last mention of the timeless children. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we have piggies. We got weird pig people, um, which was cool. Again. Again, yeah. Doctor Who seems to like pig people. Yeah. Um, and they were freaky. Yeah. Um, the prosthetics look great, but they were yeah, freaky. Yeah, the prosthetics were great, but they were creepy and silly at the same time. Yeah. Um, overall, this episode was just kind of slow to me. It was. Like, I don't really think there's a bad episode in this season. No. Nah. It's just average. A yeah. little bo- maybe a little below average. Yeah, I think like definitely so far this is my least favorite um mm-hmm. of the season. Like there were some interesting elements. Um like I thought the element of like, you know, they they discussed sort of like the wealth disparity that was happening at the time, you know, it was during right. the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Um you had kind of the the tent city set up. Um in Central Park and like um you you had this like I guess like this rich business type who was you know building towers while while other people were like basically starving to death right um and I I thought that was interesting and then I also thought like you know some of the stuff was interesting with um Talera is that her name um oh yeah yeah, I thought I thought like some of the stuff with her was interesting, but right, like the the stuff with the Daleks, I was just kind of eh. yeah. It was this the Dalek stuff was kind of pushed aside as kind of a side story. It felt like even though it's the main story, yeah, it was weird. And like you know, we got the Cult of Scarrow again, which we haven't seen since Doomsday. Uh, Doomsday. Um, and like, I thought there, it it was like, there was almost an interesting story with them with like their desperation in, um, becoming one with humanity and like evolving to survive. Right. Which would be a lot more interesting because these are Daleks. These are, these are the Nazis of Dr. Who. Right. And like, like, they, they are the superior race. And then when they start to think, if we are the superior race, why are there only four of us? Right. 
Like it, it's it's so interesting that they're going against their entire their entire Philo- philosophy theo- to right, survive philosophy and theology and everything, and it's just like it was kind of shoved aside a bit. Yeah, which and there, and there was like a whole lot of other stuff happening mm. in this episode, but I, I guess I guess it wasn't necessarily like like it wasn't necessarily boring. I guess it was just kind of muddled because there mm-hmm. was just there was just a lot happening. Mm-hmm. Right. We will see a lot more of it in the next episode, but it's just it it's a long time building up and right. Yeah. Like I, I feel like and I think I've said this with other episodes, but this this feels like maybe this just should have been a one part episode and maybe yeah. cut out a few of the subplots. Yeah, that would have been better. Like maybe just completely gut the Laszlo thing. Yeah, like Laszlo and Teller's whole subplot maybe could have could Like have... even though it's nice, it's it drags it out. Yeah. It like it, it again, it just felt like too much. Mm-hmm. And um it just all the stuff t- right. tended to weigh down the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. And uh yeah. We got proper New York, not new 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 York, but proper New York. Proper New York rendered in beautiful two thousand something CGI. <laughs> yeah 2007 um, 2007 <laughs> which you know overall the effects of the show have gotten better um yeah but i do feel like with episodes like this one and the last one um there are certain moments where you can tell they kind of like stretch themselves a bit thin yeah we gotta remember most of the money goes for the christmas specials the first episode and then the finales right so um, all the episodes in between kind of get the pennies. Yeah. And it, it didn't even necessarily look, I mean, I mean the brief shots we got of New York city, they looked okay. I think, I think the writers were very smart to keep this episode mostly contained to like, you know, the sewers, sewers or, or central park. Right, or indoor locations instead uh-huh. of like trying to have it out in the city itself. And plus, they weren't actually in New York. Right, yeah. They had to kind of create a New York to for the episode to happen in. Right. Right, like we do actually get an episode in New York in a very future episode, mm-hmm. but that's when they got a much larger budget. Yeah, and they could actually like go to New York City. Right. Which did that... I don't think that episode took place in New York, New York either, did it? Or it wasn't shot there. It was. Which one were we talking about? Uh, series seven. Angels. Oh, okay, yeah. I think yeah. there was bits of that shot in. Yeah, okay. There were well, yeah there bits was, of there, it. I mean, I, not the whole it. thing. The, the whole thing wasn't shot in New York. Yeah. No, you're right. Okay. Yeah, I was there, to... were, there were some very key, definite, one hundred percent New York moments in that. Right. Yeah. So, like later in the series, right. they actually have the budget to to film on location in New York City yeah. a little bit, and they film um, in Nevada in uh, series six a little bit. Yes. So uh, we yeah. we get some on location episodes later, which is nice. I always enjoy those. Uh-huh. Um, on location, like outside of um, the UK, I guess. Right. Because we get a lot of on location episodes in like Cardiff, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, I don't have a lot of notes. Yeah, um, there was there was one scene in particular that, um, like, I, overall, I don't think this episode was bad, but there was one scene in particular that I thought was like kind of weird and forced. With um, oh yeah, the Dalek talking to. Um, Mr. Diagoras. Uh-huh. Um, their whole conversation just felt it, it just didn't feel natural at all. You could tell someone you could tell it was a script. Yeah, it it felt like 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 it felt like somebody had this idea of like what if we had, you know, a a New York 1930s businessman talking to a Dalek and oh look they're the same um, right you know and it's like 
I mean, kind of, but not really. And then it just yeah. didn't quite, it just didn't really work for me. Right. It, it didn't click. Yeah. And like, it felt like almost in a way, it almost felt like the whole episode was supposed to be kind of built around that scene, but that was mm. the scene that really just did not work very well. So it, right. It, I don't know. What do they mean? Laszlo is just a stagehand, and he doesn't matter. Oh my gosh this this got your this got your theater Jimmy's rustling. Listen, <laughs> listen. Stagehands are some of the most important parts in the theater. If it weren't for the stagehands, it wouldn't happen. I have been a stagehand before, and it can be rough. It yeah. can be rough. I don't particularly enjoy it, but I do it when I can. And will do it when I can to help remind myself, hey, be courteous, which I'm, I am courteous, but it's also just a good reminder to put yourself in those shoes. Yeah, for sure. That's why I think everybody should work retail at some point in their life. Or fast food. Or fast food. I've never worked fast food, but I've worked retail. Be thankful. And, be thankful. <laughs> it's rough. Oh, fast, um, food. fast food is definitely way worse. Yeah. Because yeah. if you get their order wrong they bring down hell. Yeah. Cause people like fast food is like retail, but people are hangry on top of it. Yeah. And you yeah. don't want to deal with people when they're hangry. Yeah. Like I, I can understand them being busy, bu- bleh, busy, like even before I worked in fast food, but e- after I got out of fast food, I understood a lot more of just like, you know, they're busy. There's a long line. It's stressful. I get it. They actually, I, I don't like mayonnaise on my burgers or anything. And so I, I just go back around and say, Hey, I asked for no mayonnaise. I'm like, Oh, sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Did it again. I, I'm, I'm not a Karen and I don't like, let me talk to your manager. No, you're supposed to throw the burger back at them and ask to speak to the manager and <laughs> tell them you're going to end their career at yep. McDonald's yep. <laughs> because you're really hangry <laughs> and your life is falling apart. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, um, a line I really liked that was good was from the doctor. They survive. They always survive when I lose everything. Mm, yeah. Just a really good line. Yeah, and like the doctor's gone, the doctor's gone through it. He really has. Yeah, he just lost Rose, partially cause of the Daleks. So yeah, um, and I think that's why. Like, I think that's part of why Dalek episodes can be really interesting. Um, uh-huh. Although this this episode didn't quite pull it off, but because like. You know, if the Doctor has an arch enemy, it's the Daleks. And, like, the Daleks are who the Doctor fought in the Time War. The Daleks are responsible for the destruction of um, the Time Lords. Like, I think there's a really hmm. interesting conflict there that right. I really like when they tap into. Um, and we got a little bit of it with this episode, but... Right. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I, I want to see more. Mm-hmm. I really think the Daleks should have noticed the Doctor at the end yeah like they, he's just kind of standing there and they've met this incarnation of the they doctor. have met this doctor um and the cult of scar specifically meets this doctor later in their timeline i guess no this is right after uh doomsday in their timeline yeah because doomsday well, they did a temporal shift at the end of it. That's right. So they, they did a sent- temporal shift, so they got sent into a random time and place, okay, which so is back. nineteen, like the nineteen. Who knows how far back? But we find we find them in the nineteen thirties. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, they they definitely should have recognized them then, right? Because that was one thing I was trying to figure out: is like what, where does this fall on their timeline? Right, it, it takes place. It takes place after Doomsday. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't get why they yeah. didn't recognize him then. Yeah, and plus, I've seen in a lot of episodes. Just as soon as the Doctor shows up, they have like a Doctor detector always on, and they're yeah, like, "The Doctor, doctor sense starts tingling. is detected," and everything. So, was that a Spider-Man joke? Yeah, <laughs> I, said the, I said their Doctor sense is tingling. Yeah, it was another uh, Spider-Man joke. <laughs> um. 
Yeah, so we got some uh, Dalek hentai in this episode. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh my gosh, that whole sequence was so unpleasant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, that's one of those things where, you know, after the, after the Dalek suit opens and the tentacles start reaching forward, that's when you should, like, <laughs> cut to black. <laughs> Yeah. Like the whole thing with it, like enveloping him with its Dalek-y, fleshy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, one other theater thing that got me was that Martha didn't go backstage. She had to go straight through the stage. Yeah, she definitely could have gone around, but for some reason, she decides to like cross across the stage. Which seemed and like really... it would have been, it would have been even better too because Laszlo wouldn't have seen her coming. It right. would it would have worked good, better in the story as well because he wouldn't have seen her coming and she could have snuck up on him. And like Martha's really smart. Why did she not figure that out? Right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a move I could see like Adam making or Mickey making, but well, like early Mickey when he was wasn't as smart, yeah. but. Mm. for Martha to make that move, it just felt very like, it, it just didn't feel like her, her normal right. level of intelligence. Right. Yeah. No, for real. Um, that's really all I have except for one last thing. And I don't really have anything for spoilers either. Yeah. I don't either. I mean, I was just going to like mention that the human Dalek at the end, um, I don't have much to say about it except it was very freaky, but um, yeah, and a little campy. It was it was a bit I campy. Am your future. Yeah. <laughs> Looking up at the sky and then the like dramatic zoom out. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did enjoy that. Uh, okay. Well, I have okay, we're gonna get into a little more uh some more on the technical side and probably going to get into a little politics okay. so if that so if that's not your ordeal if that's not your cup of tea yeah bye but we're, <laughs> but we're going to get into it so let's talk politics politics I warning re- oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't necessarily call it politics in a way this is the first episode of new who written by a woman Oh, who's it written by? Helen Rayner. Okay. Interesting. She writes some more episodes in the future, but I started doing some research on it, and there's not a lot of female writers on Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh, especially New Who. I can kind of understand for Classic Who because of the mindset of the people back then. Right. But for this day and age... And that's one thing I love about Chimnall's era. He's got a lot more. Well, and it's it's interesting too that it took them this long, especially since like one of the right. original like creators of the show was a woman. Um, right. We saw that in the we uh, we saw her story in the um, right Verity Adventure like in she, Space and Time. Right. Yeah. No. For real. It's it's ridiculous. And like, cause there, there are a total of seven female writers for new who hmm. there's something wrong with that. There really yeah. is. And you know, we've never also never had a, a female showrunner in the show. Right. Um, right. I, I am all for it. It took them 13 tries to get a lady doctor. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, this show is an interesting mixed bag because it, it does tend to be sort of politically progressive as far as a lot of the stories go. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, like it, it definitely has pushed a lot of, um, a lot of boundaries throughout its run. You know, people talk about Dr. Who being political now it's, it's always no more no more than it's ever been it's just politics have changed um, right and we've talked about this before so yeah we've we've had this discussion before but um at the same time you know it 
it's it's never been perfect in that regard of right. like how it how it portrays um how it portrays women how it portrays minorities mm-hmm. um and you know it's it's always a work in progress and on some level i really like on on some level it, it you know it still needs work but on another right. level I, I appreciate what they've already done right and i appreciate that the show has like been really willing to push its own boundaries right you know the show is ever evolving and ever changing um it it, it doesn't get stuck in its own box to mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean you know it 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 is stuck in a box because it's stuck in the TARDIS, but it's bigger on the inside. So mm-hmm. if you, if you can unpack that, me- that weird metaphor I just made. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, hang on. Uh, um, but yeah, we- there's been like, sorry, there's been, but another, just one more small thing about that. Mm-hmm. There has been almost 200 around 200 episodes of the revived era Mm -hmm. but only a total of 14 episodes have been written by women come on doctor who let's do better that is not right at all yeah that's it's not we can do better than that yeah and that's why i do applaud chibnall for hiring a lot more female writers yeah i mean as much issue as i take with certain chibnall episodes that we Mm. (laughs) we've mentioned frequently um yep I think he's, you know, he's he's also done good things for the show. Yeah. Um, and we've gotten some very good episodes from his run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, what were you going like to say? One of those, I feel like that's one of those things that were like really. It shouldn't be political to say that like we need yeah. more women writing Doctor Who episodes, but somehow it is. Right. And ex- that's why I said it as well, just because I know there will be people out there that don't like it or anything. And I just figure, you know, get them out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the people who are still like complaining about having, you know, about Jodie Whittaker at this point, like they have, no there excuse. are other shows. <laughs> they have no excuse anymore. Yeah. It's like there are other shows. Yeah. Um, we, we, we have stuff like that for every doctor oh except, yeah, for sure. except for david Tennant. you know we had matt smith was like oh he's too young peter capaldi yeah. oh peter capaldi's too old, old. jody whitaker oh she doesn't have a wiener uh, it's i like, like my doctors to have wieners <laughs> <laughs> it's important to me uh, uh, they all have sonics it's fine <laughs> anyway um oh gosh um, yeah. Do you have any anything else to? No, that's all. Okay. Well, that's all, all right. Got. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Join us next week as we discuss Doctor Who Series Three, Episode Five, Evolution of the Daleks. <laughs>